we're going to open the Senate Committee on Education. Today is June 13th. June 13th. I was looking at May 25th. I was going crazy. <laughs> June 13th. Um, and thank you all for being here. We have one piece of business, and that is an informational hearing on Senate Bill 437. Um, I like to acknowledge to people there's been a lot of interest, and in, so there are uh, anything that's been mailed in or sent in as a testimony is posted online so that people can look at it there as well. Um, so with that, we will open our informational hearing on Senate Bill 437, and we're going to ask Steve Buckstein, Eric Fruits, and Bobby Yeager to come on up. And we'll open up with whoever wants to start first, whoever wants to be the opening <coughs> speaker. Okay, thank you, Steve. <laughs> Chair Roblin, um, Vice Chair Linthicum, members of the committee. My name is Steve Buckstein. I'm senior policy analyst and founder of Cascade Policy Institute, a public policy research center in Portland. And we're here today to share some thoughts with you, not just about this particular bill, Senate Bill 437, but the broader concept of educational savings accounts. We have branded this particular bill the Educational Opportunity Act, the power of choice. <coughs> uh, follow, following me will be Eric Fruits, who's a uh, adjunct professor at PSU talking about the fiscal impacts of the bill, which I know everyone is interested in. And following him will be Bobby Jager, who is Oregon's, was Oregon's 2012 Mother of the Year, talking uh, from a, a mother's perspective about this issue. School choice programs are popular with large segments of the public cutting across political lines, political and demographic lines. We've got some surveys of Oregonians, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, all of whom have children and they strongly support school choice in general. Not necessarily any particular bill or policy, but the idea of offering more choices to students in Oregon. Basically, school choice offers other educational resources than the current public school system or the current public school that a child is assigned to, and those choices are paid for by a portion, not all, but a portion of the funding that f goes to those public school buildings at this, at this point. Uh, I'd like to show you, first of all, hope, hope this works here, a short video that was done several years ago by then a 15-year-old homeschooled student in Southern Oregon. We asked uh, families, students, and, and uh, uh, parents in Oregon to tell us either what school choice meant to them if they had it or what it would mean to them if they didn't have it. And the student had school choice, and this is one of my favorites. It's only about a minute, so let's see if it works here. Yeah, we'll go. Yep. There it is. <laughs> Shoes. Some are fast. Some are stylish. Some are tough. Some are tall. And the shoes you choose depend on what you need to do. Choose the wrong shoes, you lose. One shoe won't work for all situations, and neither will one school. That's why school choice is important, so that each different person has the freedom to choose a school that fits their needs. School choice, if the shoe fits, Wear it. Now let's see how we can get rid of this one. Oh, that works. That's true. That does help. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, how do we get back to the screen for the next one? <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, it's right there. Okay. All right. So if the shoe fits, wear it. <coughs> the education budget that you're that you're about to pass in this building may in effect fund schools that aren't a good fit for many of our children. ESAs could help some of those families find better fitting shoes for their kids. 
unlike vouchers, and you'll hear a lot of opposition to vouchers, I know, uh, but unlike vouchers, which only let parents pay for private school tuition, ESAs may also be used for other approved educational expenses, such as online learning programs, private tutoring, community college costs, and other customized learning services and materials. Also, while vouchers fund, while voucher funds either go to private school tuition or they're lost to the family, you, whatever the amount is that the state gives you, you either use it or you lose it. With ESAs, the money can be rolled over into future years and can even be rolled over into college, and that's part of the uh, Senate Bill 437. This creates incentives for families to shop for the best educational experiences <coughs> for their children at the lowest cost because what they save they get to keep for future educational uses. Some ASA critics argue that they violate the principle of church-state separation. And I'm sure you've heard this too. In Oregon, they might think that Senate Bill 437 violates Article 1, Section 5, our so-called Blaine Amendment, which a lot of states have in our state constitution, which basically prevents the state from spending any money for the benefit of religious institutions. But it won't violate that article. Uh, the public interest law firm Institute for Justice has studied the bill and concluded that it doesn't violate either the Oregon or the U.S. Constitution. A copy of that analysis is on OLIS. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled in a similar case already in 2002, and at least two states that I'm aware of have ruled uh, on the state basis of similar Blaine amendments to Oregon that <coughs> a well-designed school choice program like Senate Bill 437 doesn't violate that section of, of the state constitution. Five states already have limited ESA programs, and Nevada passed a, a near-universal ESA program in 2015, but its legislature has yet to fund the program. In November of 2015, your committee, or the, actually the, the interim uh, Senate Education Committee in 2015, November, heard from the author of that bill in Nevada. He, was a six, he is a 16-year public school teacher and state senator, Scott Hammond. He told you that he viewed vouchers as the rotary telephones of the school choice world, and he viewed ESAs as the smartphones of that world. <coughs> a student can take some classes in their local public school. They can make other educational choices then with a proportional share of their ESA funding. So they might, for example, go half time to a local public school and the ESA uh, amount would then be half to go somewhere else. If they stay in their public school, they don't get any money in their ESA because it's already paid for through your allocation to, to that public school. These choices that students can make with an ESA are like apps on their smartphones. So let me give you a feel of how much more flexibility ESAs offer than vouchers compared to vouchers. Some of us, I, I know I do actually, remember that either our parents or our grandparents, when they wanted to make a phone call, they had to dial up the operator, the telephone company operator, and say, I want to call this number uh, across the street even or across, across town, and the operator would place the call for them. Later on, it was really glorious when we had rotary phones and we could spin out our own telephone <coughs> calls without having to use an operator. And we could even make long-distance calls if we could afford it. The per-minute charges were, were pretty steep. Then came digital phones and finally cell phones, but even the early cell phones had limited uses. You may not remember, but there were no cell phone apps before 2008. There were none. Today, there are two billion people in the world, two billion people in the world that use cell phone apps. So all you could do before 2008 on your cell phone was make phone calls, maybe, make te maybe send text messages, and maybe make a slow internet connection to the World Wide Web. But just nine years later, now, Apps are everywhere. You may have dozens of them on your own phone. You may only use a handful, but you have access to many, many more. And as I said, two, two billion people have apps on their cell phones now. So things today in the smartphone world, in the communication world, are worlds, uh, world away from what they were just in 2008. I mean, the world has changed so much in many ways since 2008, except to a large extent in public education. Consider the children in our schools today and some of the children I guess, sitting behind me here in this hearing. Many of them have never known a world without smartphones and their apps. All of us have, but many of them haven't. They were born uh, with their parents using cell phones and using apps. 
Rotary telephones, even landlines, are likely just historical oddities to these children. Much of their world is new, except the way that we adults try to educate them by sitting them down in rows in classrooms with kids their same age. We do it in front of one teacher lecturing about, the same sub about some subject that they may or may not have an interest in or th and they may or may not find is relevant to their lives. And then I got to thinking, many teachers see kids' smartphones as a problem, right? I think you've talked about it in this, in this committee in the past. Kids are using their cell phones instead of listening to the teacher. It's a, it's a problem in the, in the class. They're watching their screens instead of sitting politely in those rows listening to a math lesson at 10 or a history lesson at 2. We say we want our kids to learn how to take advantage of technology. We say we want them to take STEM classes and become prepared for the, the jobs in the future. And we do. So why do we see their use of technology now as a problem, but we think they should be able to use it later in their professions? Some of them are just not paying attention to the teachers, and that's a problem. They're bored with school. The shoes we make them wear aren't good fits for many of them. We know that they'll likely find value in many of those subjects they are not interested in now. We understand that as adults. But if they don't find value in them now and they don't learn them, they're not going to be equipped to take advantage of, of what they learned in the future. Or they may have hard life lessons before they learn those things later on. <coughs> in 2007, excuse me, in 2007, the House Subcommittee on Education Innovation, which was chaired by uh, Representative Betty Comp at the time, heard compelling testimony about some of those kids about some of those kids during a hearing on an earlier educational choice bill, which back then was House Bill 2010. That testimony was given by a black Portlander by the name of Jomo Greenidge. And he describes himself today as an educator and a technologist. Jomo wasn't able to be here with us today. He wanted to. But he hopes that you'll watch his earlier testimony, which is about three minutes uh, from that hearing in 2007, and think about how education savings accounts could help kids like him and kids <coughs> that he's talking about in his testimony today. So I'm going to try again here and play you a short video. My name is Joe McGreenage. I'm here to support uh, House Bill 3010. I'm a social, social entrepreneur in Portland, also an, an educator. Um, students I work with do go to that Jefferson High School, the majority of them. I'm about three or four blocks away. You know, when you go to rent an apartment building, uh, you can ask the people that run the apartment building, is this place good? But who you really want to ask are the tenants. And when you ask those kids, where do you go to school, Jeff? Is it good? And they say, it's horrible. And I say, why do you go? Because that's where we go. That's life. If you live here, you go to Jeff. Now, there's parents that have more economic means, and they choose, for many of the same reasons, the last hour and 45 minutes, whatever, um, to, to provide opportunities for their kids. But there's some parents and some kids, that opportunity is not there for them. And sometimes um, for us as, as educators, we have to look at, at ourselves and say, maybe we're not the best solution for the kids that we're dealing with. So House Bill 3010 to me, it, for, the, for some kids, it prov provides the opportunity for some kids to thrive in an environment that would suit them. For parents, like Matt said, it, it provides opportunity for choice. But for us as a state, uh, for educators that work within the, the state system, for uh, many of the legislative government that we've elected, and specifically the subcommittee, it provides an opportunity, in my opinion, for integrity. Because the integrity that comes across, it's the, without this bill and bills like it, you take a position of arrogance that says, we are the best at what we do, and what we do will serve all of our kids. And if the best we can do does not serve our kids, then we should provide an opportunity for the, get them to go to somebody that can. That's what this bill does. It provides an opportunity for kids to be in a place where they should go. When I was 14, um, I loved math and science. <laughs> it's, it's all I, I, I could do. And um, 
I scored high enough on the SAT to be um, uh, awarded uh, membership in the, in the men's organization. I had scholarships all across the country. I never got to participate in those because I had a 1.2 grade point average, despite the fact that on my own time, I was teaching math, college level math, discrete mathematics, dynamic programming, um, exploratory data analysis to junior high kids to show them that they could do it. My problem was not that I wasn't smart or that I didn't love to learn. My problem was my school was a bad fit for me. And I did not graduate and not go to college for seven more years because I hated school when I was a kid. Now, my, my situation's not unique. I can tell you about a young person that I work with now who's known on the street as Tizzy. And in his own time, he writes computer games. He, he programs in an action script. Guys that program an action script make $30, $40 an hour. And he does it on his own time for free with little documentation quite casually. This kid has a 1.2 grade point average and did not graduate with his class at Jefferson. And it's not because he's not talented, and it's not because he doesn't love to learn, because he'll put the time into work and learn when it's relevant to him. The problem is his school is a bad fit for him. Please provide an opportunity for kids to get the opportunity to go to a school that's a good fit for them. That's what this bill does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for mentoring other people, too. You're welcome. My name is Jomo Greenidge. I'm here to So Jomo gave that testimony again in 2007, which was a year before there were any smartphone apps. Many students in our schools today and all the kids entering our schools tomorrow will grow up in a world with modern communication and app technology. I think it's time we recognize that much of the money we tax and spend on their educations might not be meeting their educational needs. It's time we consider the education savings account approach and let their families have some control over the money, how the money is spent, to better meet those needs. Other states have debated and some have expanded their ESA programs this year. Uh, I believe the pressure to pass similar bills is only going to grow around the country as people realize the uh, the benefits of, an e of the ESA concept. We know that Senate Bill 437 is not going to pass this year. We appreciate that you've granted this informational hearing to us. But the families that need these choices, who know that the schools their kids are stuck in from their standpoint are not a good fit for them, they can't wait very much longer. I mean, kids are only in second grade once, <coughs> as, as you all know. So we hope that you will really consider this concept, not necessarily this particular bill, uh, but this concept, and move forward with an education savings account program as soon as possible, hopefully in the next session, that will meet many of their needs and that will really uh, help these kids come into the modern world and learn the way that meets their needs. Thank you. Uh, Chair Roblin, members of the committee, my name is Eric Fruits. I'm a Portland area economist and adjunct professor at Portland State University, where I've taught courses in economics and public finance. <coughs> my testimony today summarizes uh, some detailed analysis that I've submitted to OLIS, so I'm going to try to summarize that, uh, try to simplify things a little bit. Uh, education savings accounts, the way they're designed is they deposit a, a percent, a share of the funds that the state would otherwise spend to educate a student. They, they take that money take a share of it, deposit that in the education savings account to be used by the student's family. The family can then use those funds to spend on things like private school tuition, uh, homeschooling, educational expenses, and other approved educational expenses. Uh, after the school year is over, those funds that are remaining in, in the account uh, can be rolled over and used in subsequent years and may even be used for college education. I believe as this bill is written, it, it's only at education at a Oregon University or, or community college. Um, Empirical research on private school choice finds evidence that private school choice delivers benefits to participating students, particularly in the area of educational attainment, such as graduation rates. Uh, currently, Arizona, Florida, Mississippi, and Tennessee have active ESA programs, but those are limited to particular groups of students, such as those with special needs. Nevada passed a near-universal ESA bill in 2015, but it is yet to be funded. Oregon Senate Bill 437 would introduce a universal ESA program in Oregon covering all K-12 students. As I noted before, ESAs are frequently designed so that the amount of funding support provided is less than the, than the amount the state would otherwise 
pay for a student to attend public school. And that's a key component of it. The money that goes in the ESA is less than what you're currently spending per student. The state then recoups or gets to keep the difference. In this way, ESAs can be designed to produce a net fiscal benefit, that is a cost savings to state and local government budgets. Uh, I put up here figure one, which is a, uh, a bigger version of the of figure one from uh, the report that I've loaded to OLA's. Where the cost savings come from are from public schools students transitioning to private schools and homeschooling. So they're, they're leaving the public school system and going into another uh, private sector schooling system. The reduction in public school enrollment reduces the demand on state and local spending on, those edu on education. And again, because the money provided to the ESA is less than the amount than the state currently spends in, in state and local districts, this represents a cost savings. Now there is a cost, there is an actual cost to doing this, and this is where you have students who are already currently enrolled in private school who then take advantage of it. In some ways you could say they might get a windfall because they're already enrolled in private school and then they get the, the ESA funding. And that is the, the probably the biggest cost driver of an ESA program. But a careful balancing of, of the amount deposited in the ESA uh, and you have a way that the program can break even. Also, it, it's sensitive, and we'll talk about this in a second, it's sensitive to what share of those private school students will actually transition or take advantage of the ESA. In my analysis, I assume that 90% of private school students will take advantage of the ESA. That's a pretty big share. Uh, in other words, you know, almost every student that's in private school will take advantage of the ESA. That's pretty aggressive, and it's also probably not accurate. It it's actually may really be a much lower share. For example, in Indiana, which has a voucher program, roughly one-third of the schools that are able to participate in the, in the program actually choose not to. And so you may find that a, a large number of private school students do not take advantage of the ESA for whatever reason. So what I have here in, in figure one is to show how there can be a balancing based upon how much that ESA amount uh, varies. And I have a little clicker here. What we have here is kind of up to the top, the real big outlier out there is the cost to state and local governments of SB 437 as it was introduced. Um, what uh, SB 437 did when it was introduced was it, it actually gave, uh, it gave the students uh, who are uh, disabled or from low income families, gave them 100% of the amount that the state pays uh, and then other students, everyone else, 90%. And you can see that the fiscal impact is a little bit more than 200 million, in other, and that's a net cost. In other words, it would have cost state and local governments 200 million dollars. And you know, I consider myself fairly fiscally conservative, and so that would be a deal breaker to me, and it'd probably be a deal breaker to you. So what I do is conducted this fiscal analysis, and one of the things that's important is to what extent, based on the pricing of uh, a private school, would students be sensitive? You know, would they shift out of uh, public school into private school. And what you get then is a curve. You could get a responsiveness based upon how much you're putting in that ESA account. And so what I did for my analysis is I found the point where the program essentially breaks even. I also made it a round number that where it breaks even, so it actually breaks even at a different number, but this is close enough to say it breaks even. So if you give a $6,000, the, the current amount that the state gives to, pays for students is a little bit more than $8,000, uh, a little bit under $8,500 per student. If we gave students who have a disability or come from a low income family $6,000 and then gave $4,500 to all the other students, uh, so students who are not in poverty who don't have a disability, gave them $4,500, we find that the ESA program, and this is the Dash 1 amendment, so the 437 Dash 1 would actually break even. It represents a state and local cost savings of about six million dollars a year. That's close enough for government work to say it breaks even. Uh, so what we have here is, again, this is a concept. We all understand that 437 is not going anywhere, but going forward, as we think about other bills and other concepts, we shouldn't just let the first number that comes out in the introduction of the bill drive our decision whether or not to support it, because there are ways that we can adjust th these ESA bills so that they can actually break even. Now what's really interesting here is 
if you were all you worried about, if you didn't care about the kids or anything else, and all you cared about was saving money, uh, there's a way that you can optimize this. There's a point where you can actually save about $53 million a year, and that would be at a rate of about $3,000 for students who are uh, who have a disability or have come from a low-income family and uh, roughly twenty two hundred dollars for all other students much smaller ESA amount but that would actually generate about fifty three million dollars in, in additional funds available uh, at the state and local level now there's been no real comprehensive analysis of the fiscal impacts of, of ESAs on st state and local budgets in other words the programs that are in effect uh, there hasn't really been an analysis of how they've affected state and local budgets and part of that is because uh, the programs haven't been in place very long so vouchers are kind of the closest comparable school choice program and th this research has found that targeted voucher programs do tend to produce fiscal benefits to state budgets and again, these net benefits are because the amount of the voucher is smaller than the current uh, per student funding. Uh, the most recent research that I could find uh, found that the cost savings per students in the states that have these voucher programs is about $500 to $6,400 per student. And that's for the 2011 fiscal year. So with inflation, that amount could be bigger. In other words, there are real fiscal cost savings. The ESAs do not cannot and probably will not break the budget if they are designed correctly. In addition to the potential benefits to state and local school budgets, a uh, recent review of the empirical research finds that private school choice does deliver benefits, particularly in the area of educational attainment. And the review also finds that school choice tends to help the achievement of students who also remain in public school because it reduces some of the burden on the public school system. So aside from the basic principle that students should be allowed or parents should be able to choose the education solution that fits with their child's own unique situation, if the shoe fits, ESAs can be crafted in a way that they have no net fiscal impact on state and local districts. SB 437-1 is one such careful crafting. I'm done. So I'm the mom. I get to talk about what really counts in my life. Senator Roblin, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Bobby Jager, and I'm the mom of 13 children, and there they are. Today, I'm speaking as the mother of 13 and the grandmother to 16 grandchildren. Yes, all are equally wonderful and probably even more wonderful than their parents were. My mom used to say, if I'd known the grandchildren were going to turn out so well, we would have had them first. <laughs> In 2012, it was my honor and privilege to be chosen as Oregon's Mother of the Year. I come before you today not just as an advocate for Senate Bill 437, but as a mother to advocate for Oregon's future, the children for our state. My desire is for each of them to have the opportunity to find the spark that ignites their personal education fuse. The evolution of my ideas about how best to support the education of my children began when my first two children entered the Department of Defense, the DOD Elementary School at Tyndall Air Force Base in Panama City, Florida. At that school, my children endured rather than prospered. I augmented their, their schoolwork, as I always had done, by reading stories and working each evening to help them with concepts that the school was supposed to be teaching. But from that time forward, my first two sons were scarred with the experiences they had had during their first encounter with the one-size-fits-all education. In my ignorance, I believed my children needed to work harder at school. But as I soon discovered, it was the school, the attitude of the teachers and administrators that were the greater that was the great part of the reason why my children were not thriving. My second son came home one day with a picture he had colored in kindergarten. It had a frowny face on it with the comments, wrong color. Let's just say that our family's relationship with that school were not positive. No spark, just water on the fuse. From Florida, we moved to Saudi Arabia, where a DOD contracted with a private school for dependents of military personnel. Scarred by their first school experience, my boys continued to struggle, but the school worked with us, and although our two boys didn't find their spark, they went to school with anticipation each day. 
Our third child, first daughter, was identified by the school for her ability to work hard and never give up. The school recognized that she was not any more intelligent than any other child, but that she was tenacious in her desire to get her work done. So with our permission, her teacher flooded her with assignments and our daughter thrived. At the end of her first year, she was doing work far beyond her peers. Her spark was lit. From Saudi Arabia, we moved to Gila Bend, Arizona, in the middle of the desert, where my husband was assigned as air base engineer. The school experience there was in included extreme bullying and very poor teachers. It's there that my husband and I began to homeschool our children. Before we could homeschool, the state required us to take a test to determine if we were worthy enough to teach our own children. And it's there that I realized the cost of education materials and the horror of how much textbooks cost. In Gila Bend, we had our seventh child, and I developed curriculums for the oldest four children. I also fell in love with homeschooling my children. I taught each of them to read, opening up the world of books for all of them. From Gila Bend, we moved to Warner Robins Air Force Base in Georgia, just south of Macon, where, yes, they had another DOD school, but wonder of wonders, my daughter's teacher from Saudi Arabia was there, and my daughter was in her class. Our boys continued to struggle in the classroom environment, but the experience was better than in Florida. Still, no spark for the boys. My husband retired after 18 months in Georgia, and we moved to Oregon, his home state, and we enrolled in the Willamina School District. After the first day on the bus, my sons came home from school and asked us what the F word meant. As an aside, my always clever husband informed me that education professionals refer to this experience as socialization. At that, a lack of socialization in the major region given not to homeschool. In any event, we were determined to be a part of our community, and for us, that meant supporting our local schools and our districts. Our children had some fine teachers and some very bad ones, but ultimately our experiences with the school discouraged us, and we couldn't afford to put our children in private school. So I again took on the task of homeschooling my children up to the point of high school. The costs of homeschooling are high, but we managed, and I networked with a very vibrant homeschool community, and I loved every minute of it. During this time, our 10th child got his first spark when he played a major role in a Shakespeare play put on by his fellow homeschool friends. If you were watching last night, American Ninja Warrior on NBC, you saw that boy. You got to see him fly through the air and land in a pool of water. <laughs> Our first son <laughs> dropped out of high school at 15 and got his GED at 16, never having found his spark. He's been fully employed ever since. Our second son, after his negative experiences in kindergarten, always struggled with learning. In an IEP program through the high school, he graduated, and he went to work, got married, and tried to join the Marines. But his ASFAB score was too low, and he was rejected. His public, school, his public high school experience had not even provided him the ability to pass a very rudimentary test. So for the first time in his life, he chose to focus. He studied, and he retook the ASFAB. No school ever lit his spark. To attain his desired goal, he lit it himself. As a Marine, <coughs> he fought in the Iraq War, came home, got a job as a federal prison guard, and is now the supervisor of the Sheridan Correction Institutional Fleet of Vehicles. Our daughter, of normal intelligence, got an inter-district transfer approved and attended the only school in our area where the F word was not a prevalent verb, the Sheridan Japanese Charter School. But when she was told she couldn't participate in high school sports, she transferred to Sheridan High. Hard worker that she was, her teachers were never able to help her understand math well. There was no math spark. So for $1,000, we sent her to Sylvan Learning. Center where they helped her to find her math spark. She greatly improved her SAT score, math score, and she was awarded a full ride. She received the Ford Foundation Scholarship. 
She went on to earn her master's degree of science degree in exercise science. She's now the mom of three little ones. Not feeling inspired or even challenged in high school, our next son got a GED at 16, worked full time for three years at minimum wage jobs to pay for a two year church mission to Chile. Never inspired to study in high school, he was immersed in a six week church Spanish language class and set off for Chile. When he returned, he had a love for language and organization that I never saw at home. He founded his spark. He went to college at BYU and OSU, studying Hebrew, Russian, and Chinese, and he's fluent in Spanish also. Graduating from the OSU ROTC program and now serves in the Air Force. He's a first lieutenant. He's the young man that will push the button and turn the key. He's a missile air. He recently earned a master's degree in management and executive leadership with a 4.0 grade point average. Without going through my entire family's education chronology, I'll finish up by telling you about one son who basically flunked out of the Sheridan Japanese School. Steve, can you change the slide? He definitely was a failure there except for one thing. The school required a special project he was to complete by each student. My, my son decided to weld a sign for the school. He went to a local valley artist in metal and said he'd do anything if he could learn to weld and make a sign for the school. So for weeks, he cleaned the artist's shop and learned the art of welding and metal sculpture. The sign, as you see in the picture, he designed and made, and it hangs still today at the Sheridan Japanese School at the entrance. This is not the son who made it. This is son number 10. He also went to the school. He may have failed his studies, but the school motivated him to find something he could succeed at. He found his spark. Today, he's a 4.0 student at the Marriott School of Business, and he owns his own company. School choice means private, public, online, charter, and public, and I've already said that, but I want you to understand that we're not talking about not having public school be a school choice. It worked for some of my kids. It didn't work for everybody, and that's why the ESA is so important to my heart. The point I have tried to convey with my testimony is that the true purpose of the publicly funded education should be to help each child identify their spark so they can spend the rest of their lives educating themselves. Sadly, the pathway offered by Oregon's current education system is poorly lit and hiding the spark from many of our children. And though many existing public schools pay lip service to maintaining high standards and accountability, that has not been my family's experience. The Educational Opportunity Act, the power of choice, will finally give Oregon's families the flexibility they need to find their children's spark, wherever that may be. Thanks. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah, any questions? Anybody here? Senator Lipscomb. Just a, a question with regard to the estimates you had. The, it, it's interesting that at the $3,000 mark, you see a net gain to public schools. I realize there's some cautious rationale for determining um, wh what that is. What, what, what did your model look like for assuming student fit? Um, because you've got you've got a, a varied population, one size doesn't fit all, and yet you had to make assumptions. The 90% number, is that a constant number in here that you referred to assuming 90% of those disabled would take this? It, you know, what, what, what does this look like? Yes, Chair Roblin, uh, Senator Lithicum. Uh, yeah, the 90% was regarding private school students. I just assumed that if you're in private school already, you're gonna ask for that ESA money. And I figured 90% was fair. And as I mentioned, 90% it, it, could be high. What that does by assuming 90%, that makes it more expensive. So I may be overestimating the cost of the ESA program. Uh, one of the challenges you have is trying to model this. So we can't really dive down really deeply into the, the unique aspects of each student, but we did try to uh, model certain things like, for example, what share of the population would qualify for um, uh, either low income or being disabled. 
And for example, in the private school sector, it's roughly half, <coughs> half, you know, the, it's, it's about 25 percent in in the public sector and about 13 percent in the private sector would qualify. And so you have a smaller share of the private school population that would qualify for that bigger dollar amount. And, and those are all things that we tried to model. I, I think as we went, as we go forward you know, into different, um, you know, next time we try to have a, a measure, you know, I would love to work with LRO because I think LRO probably has a lot of good information that I probably can't get access to. You know, the more information we have, the more we could do. Uh, I dug pretty deep to try to find an, in data that was out there and worked with what I got, which I have to admit is in, imperfect, but it's as good as we're going to get right now. Right. Did you make any assumptions about uh, the demand curve that these families, you know, different people will bow out at different points based on their own assessment? Did you make any assumptions about uh, that? Yes, and the assumption is based on the research that I found. Uh, it's based on an economic concept known as elasticity, which is the responsiveness to, to price changes. Uh, we found the elasticity is about 0.11, which is actually pretty small, which means that a 10 percent decrease in private school, the cost of private school, would increase uh, private school enrollment by about 1 percent, you know, so it's not that big. Uh, and so that's why you get that little U-shaped curve, because if you have your, if the amount of money that you're giving is too small, you know, if it's like 100 bucks, you're not going to shift a lot of people from public school to private school. Uh, and so that's why you get that, that kind of curve. So you're going to have a lot fewer people shifting at 3,000 than you will at, say, 6,000 or 9,000. Right. And so I was looking for that elasticity number. Yeah, so there is a response. It's not just a straight line relationship. It, it, there's a percentage change. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I, I guess what I will say is I have to look at the math behind the statistical stuff because I go at it. Once the person leaves the school, the school system, there isn't any money for them any longer, even though we're paying 3000 out. So um, there's an amount of money, that, and oftentimes we base that on the number of students there are. So if we have a decrease in students, the amount of money that we might put into the system would be less. Um, even though they're paying out the 3000 So there, I, I don't know that I see the gain. I've got to figure that out in my head. Well, the gain, uh, Chair Roblin, uh, a big part of the gain comes on the, the, the local side because, as you know, uh, probably from crafting the, the budget, uh, the, the state only pays a portion. They pay a big portion, but they only pay a portion. The other chunk of money comes from local property taxes. And so that property tax amount doesn't change it stays and so uh, that's why it's useful to combine the state and local savings because uh, because it really is a single pot of money and that's one of the, the challenges we have when we're comparing state spending from state to state Oregon has very high state spending per capita it's because we pay for a big chunk of local school districts education uh, so yeah so where you know the biggest chunk of the savings to answer your question comes on that local side because the, the dollar amount doesn't change Smart. Thank you. For Thank that. you. Any other questions from anybody? No. Appreciate it very much. With that, we'll call up Lori Wimmer, Richard Donovan, and Chris Vogel. Is this your clicker? That's theirs. Oh, that's theirs. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee members, for your record, Lori Wimmer representing 44,000 members of the Oregon Education Association in K-12 and community colleges. And it's my honor to be here today with a different perspective about Senate Bill 437 specifically and uh, vouchers more generally, and to explain why our members and the vast majority of Oregonians oppose such proposals. First of all, a bit of history. Economist Milton Friedman is widely credited for inventing the means of rerouting public dollars for private purposes. Uh, in his 1955 paper, The Role of Government in Education, the modern voucher movement was launched in the hope of creating competition among schools to decrease education costs and therefore to decrease taxes. In 1983, the Koch brothers supported American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC as a lot of us know it, first started promoting in model legislation vouchers and other school privatization efforts. 
Alex's model legislation sought to create financial incentives for people to take their children out of public schools and to enroll them in private, for-profit, religious, and other options. The commentary accompanying this legislation noted that its purpose was, quote, to introduce normal market forces into education and to, quote, dismantle the control and power of teachers by directing money from public institutions to private ones. According to Dr. Friedman, who spoke to Alex in 2006, vouchers are really a step toward, and this is a quote, abolishing the public school system. In recent years, due to the organization's general failure to sell the idea to a dubious public, the messaging, promotion, and even the name of such schemes became more nuanced. Instead of showing their true intent, voucher proponents focused on the idea of parent choice and of advancing a more sympathetic goal of subsidizing private schooling for poor and disabled students. Additionally, Alec began tinkering with the language and mechanisms of the concept. The bill before you today, Senate Bill 437, is a rewording section by section of that ALEC model legislation, and I've included it in my written testimony, so you can see it for yourself and compare. They've changed some words to conform to our o ORSs, but I it's identical. Uh, vouchers, whether disguised as scholarships or savings account or tuition tax credits, should not be confused with 529 plans, for example, which are much more benign and come from one's own resources, not the state's. They all serve essentially the same purpose to fund private and religious education and homeschooling and to advantage primarily affluent families who would pay private tuition anyway, the windfill you heard a previous testimony or admit to, uh, state support notwithstanding. OEA opposes such legislation for several reasons. First, vouchers don't work. They don't improve educational outcomes, just they lack accountability and oversight, and they fund schools that discriminate. They don't give parents a true choice, but instead allow private schools to pick and choose students, which is why they may in some cases argue that they have better outcomes because they can cherry pick. Finally, they di divert public dollars from public schools to private and religious entities. This impacts educational quality for the vast majority of students in Oregon who choose to enroll in their public schools. If private schools were such a stellar option, it would have to be said that such schemes only advantage a few at the expense of the many, and that's not an issue of choice, that's about equity. Let's take Indiana, it was mentioned earlier. It's a state with the largest voucher program in the country. More than half of its participants have never enrolled in any sort of school, public or private. They're homeschoolers. Another observable phenomenon of the Indiana experiment is that though minority and low income students were used to justify the shift of public revenues to private entities, it is white and affluent students who benefit most in Indiana. <laughs> After Indiana instituted its program, white voucher students rose from 46% that first year to 60% today. The share of black students dropped from 24% down to 12, just half as many. Recipients in Indiana are also increasingly suburban and middle class. Another interesting development across the country is that the degree to which these vouchers and voucher-like programs serve to prop up financially cash-strapped religious institutions. In a recent study of Milwaukee, Wisconsin's voucher program, researchers found that they are now a dominant source of funding for many churches and that parishes running voucher-accepting schools get more revenue from vouchers than they do from their worshipers, and that's a quote. While Senate Bill 437 purports to make it possible for students from low-income households and to attend private and religious schools, let's look at the facts. Under the Dash 1 amendment, recipients would receive between $4,800 and $6,000 per year to pay for all costs, tuition, fees, transportation, and so on. Yet, look at the top 15 private schools in Oregon. I got, uh, that's also in your record. It shows schools that range from 20, 28, 26, uh, 14, 16,000, 22,000, 54,000. A $6,000 voucher program for a poor family is not gonna send that kid to that school anyway because of their income situation. So a subsidy that does not cover the going rate for these pricey schools is not going to 
uh, provide opportunity if that's what it is being marketed to do. Most, if not all, of these schools are selective as well, and they're legally allowed to discriminate in accepting and retaining applicants based on GPA, GPA and other kinds of qualifications. Public schools, by contrast, accept all students, regardless of race, family income, religion, academic record, ability. Private entities to which this money would flow are not re required even under this bill to comply with Oregon health and safety standards or curriculum or teaching quality or other student protections. Uh, and as a parenthetical, I would note, we don't even uh, regulate or track private schools in Oregon anymore. That was dropped during the last recession. There's scant accountability baked into the concept and huge processing costs for the state treasurer who would be expected to annually approve more than 90,000 ESA applications per year according to the proponent's own math and the 3% set aside uh, allowed for administrative costs is laughably insufficient for that purpose. According to national research, 70% of Americans oppose funneling taxpayer money to private schools via vouchers and their ilk. Indeed, Oregonians rejected a ballot measure proposal to do this uh, back in the 70s, as have voters in Washington, Alaska, and several other states. Rural schools are particularly vulnerable to the fiscal harm that state statewide voucher programs uh, would cause by siphoning public resources to private operators. Though some proponents try to frame this as a civil rights issue, the facts make that claim incredible. For instance, in Georgia's voucher-like tax credit program, uh, it was billed as a way of helping African American and Latino families, but most of the scholarships have in fact been awarded to white students from upper income families. Over a time, a universal voucher system would not only destroy public education by undermining it financially, but it would also increase segregation. One final point we'd like you to consider. Proponents have issued a legal opinion that Oregon's Blaine Amendment uh, relating to Article 1, Section 5 of the Oregon Constitution would allow for the enactment of this bill because Oregon courts would likely follow the U.S. Supreme Court's lead. They make the point that this program would be seen to have a valid secular purpose and would be neutral with respect to religion. The opinion of their lawyer also speculates that such a proposal would be upheld because Article 8, Section 3 requires only the establishment of a uniform and general system of common schools which voucher proponents insist their plan would not undermine. The opinion fails to note, however, that in Oregon's Constitution also exists Article 8, Section 8, which further requires the state to fund the public education system sufficiently. That would be even more challenging that, than it already is in today's terms if an ESA were enacted, in fact. Uh, proponents scoff at the notion that their calculated fiscal impact of $200 million would impair school funding meaningfully. Well, that $200 million is exactly how much we have as a gap between the budget you all just passed for the state school fund and what our belief is a CSL is, in other words, a no layoff budget. So that's a pretty significant number if you ask me. I also question the math, uh, uh, as you had, Mr. Chair. I took their back of the napkin assumptions about 90% of 61,000 private school students and 7% of 563,000 public school students and came up with a total of 94,310 students and at $6,000 a year in um, this scholarship or this uh, giveaway, you would be talking about a billion dollars of biennium for these students. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Richard Donovan on behalf of the Oregon School Boards Association. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify on this issue. This is an interesting issue. It's a timely issue. Um, and it's good that we're still doing something, even though uh, we're past the second chamber deadline. Um, you have my written uh, testimony already. I will go over it briefly. The, the kind of first point that I want to make is one that we're all familiar with because I know I've said it in this committee before. Uh, schools in Oregon are generally underfunded. The public education is, system is generally underfunded. It has been for a number of years. In my written testimony, I took a, a graph, a chart that was, not a graph, a chart that was created by ODE as part of their QEM report, the QEC report that's issued every biennium that um, just lists um, QEM, full QEM full implementation costs legislative appropriation and the difference and the percentage difference between the two. Go, it goes back to 99, it projects to 2019-2021, uh, and the difference 
in between QEM implementation and the actual appropriation or projected appropriation ranges between 20 and 40 percent. Mm -hmm. So the legislature is 20 to 40 percent light on the app versus QEM appropriation, and ha you know, kind of for the for the recent past. Um, and I think that this is relevant to the the um, OSBA's concerns with the concepts of ESA, Senate Bill 437, and vouchers generally, because the idea of ESAs is, is kind of one around a per student value, a per student calculation that that these students should be able to take their three to six to seven to eight thousand dollars that is theirs. And I think that's based upon a, a very fundamental misunderstanding or fundamental uh, assumption that is different than, than what anybody in LFO or ODU would tell you, which is that this is not, the state school fund is not a valuation system, it is a distribution system. We have a public education system, and the amount of, the amount of money that goes into the system is the amount of money the legislature allocates and then is distributed based on the number of weights in a formula. The seven, six, or seven thousand dollars per student is not what that kid is worth, it's what they're allocated. And so that's allocated to districts, and districts can choose to move the money around as is necessary. As often happens in some schools, uh, kids are lower percentage of ADMW versus other kids in other schools in the same district. This is just the way that that um, that we have chosen to manage our our uh, education funding in the state of Oregon because that's what we have. And until such a time that schools are properly funded at a quality level, I think it's really difficult to start thinking about portability and school choice, especially because the alternative options that the proponents of the measure advocate for are not held to the same standards that Oregon public schools are held to. Um, last night when I wrote uh, my testimony, I picked up some of the topics that the legislature, this committee considered and or passed this session. Uh, just this committee, dyslexia ed, CT STEM regulation, culture responsive pedagogy, PE minutes, all these kinds of things are things that, that the legislature has mandated upon school districts, either directly through law or by um, delegating power to, to ODE. These are the things that schools have to do. And other, you know, other kind of private sector or, or non-public education options are not held to those same standards. So instructional minutes, all things like that are things that, that public schools have to do. And public schools have to do it for every kid that shows up. Age six to 21, schools will accommodate students they will uh, generally give them a bus ride, make sure they have access to nutritious meals, and teach across standards as best as they can. And this investment from the state is an investment in the public good. And that's really what I think we're talking about here is we're talking about taking money away from schools that are already underfunded and taking money away from the public good. And for us at school districts, kind of challenging that, that, that policy choice would be one that really concerned uh, school districts. Um, just in, in terms of a couple other points I wanted to make and didn't uh, put in my written testimony, most states, you know, ECS, the Education Commission of the States, released a report just yesterday that was timely. It was about vouchers, which may or may not be the same as ESAs. I'm not sure, but I think they're very similar. Um, they kind of described the key takeaway about vouchers as being really narrowly targeted. There's not, uh, I don't think nationally, any sort of demonstrated success with vouchers, but um, when they're targeted, they seem to have had limited success in certain places, but a broad voucher program has never demonstrated uh, benefits. And um, I would like to follow up also, I, you know, there's still some questions in, in OSB minds about the constitutionality under the Oregon Constitution of this because the Oregon Constitution does have a more rigorous standard. And I kind of spoke informally to um, lawyers in LC and that I think that they would tell you that it remains a concern for them. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Christine Vogel, uh, League of Women Voters Education Policy Chair for our Legislative Action Team. I provided uh, in my written testimony um, several links I'd like to call to your attention so that you could choose to follow those at your leisure. Uh, within the National Conference of State Legislators, um, a 2016 brief summarizes the new generation of school vouchers, the education savings account. So you may wish to follow that, see what they have to say and uh, what other states are doing. As you know, uh, the League of Women Voters um, has testified before that we support public education and we oppose school vouchers. 
We're also a member of the National Coalition for Public Education, and it also opposes school vouchers because voucher programs divert desperately needed resources away from the public school system to fund the education of a few students. In addition, the voucher programs have proven ineffective, they lack accountability to the taxpayers, they deprive students of the right to be provided a public school education, and in some places they do threaten religious liberty. A call attention also to another link for the Center for Media and Democracy. Uh, proponents um, have been moving away from the term vouchers towards education savings accounts, but ultimately the result is the same. It shifts taxpayer funds from public schools to private institutions. And often when first proposed in states, um, there is an effort to say that these programs, these vouchers, the um, education savings accounts are designed to reach out to low income and to people with disabilities. Um, in most of those states, that's the beginning and um, continues to broaden to serve a broader group after that first empathy for um, children of color, disabled, low-income children um, open that door. Another study I think that uh, Richard just called attention to as well with the Education Commission of the States, it is a trusted source of comprehensive knowledge and unbiased resources. And they just published um, a comprehensive report comparing all of the states and education savings accounts and voucher aspects. So call your attention to that one as well for the future. This bill as it's written now would allow for funding to be spent any way the parent sees fit, including uh, programs online that are not operated by public schools, a tutor, or a tutoring facility that is accredited by the state, regional, or national accrediting association, private teachers, private tutoring organizations, or simply to fund a parent who is or will be teaching a qualified child in the child's home. We have a tough time now funding our public education programs. If we look at the numbers in the bill, taking $6,500 um, from that to fund a child with disability, a 6,000, excuse me, not 6,500, or um, a child at less than 185% of the federal poverty level, or 4,500 for any child, that drain um, is significant on our public schools and many of the cost of the public schools are fixed. Uh, if that child leaves, not only does the school not have that funding, but they still have to pay the same fixed costs. So it continues to put a strain on our public schools. So in closing, this is just a newer rendition of vouchers. Uh, League opposes those. Uh, we oppose this legislation and we will continue to oppose similar legislation in future years. Thank you. Questions? I guess the only one that I have that I continue to have and have ever since I got into education, and that is what do you see um, as avenues for us to pursue other than just resources, which I agree with you, we do not have enough of, um, to meet the needs of all the kids. I thought Bobby did a nice job of explaining the needs of her kids and the opportunities which existed or didn't exist. Um, and having been a high school principal and a math teacher and all those things, there were kids I was not as successful as I would like to have been. And I always looked for ways to find better opportunities for them. And as many of you know, we had alternative schools and charter schools and my school all on the same campus trying to figure out how to get there. And sometimes we didn't do as good a job asking parents what their child needed, and sometimes they're the best answer to that. Sometimes they aren't, they'll be the first to admit it, <laughs> that, that they couldn't find the answer for their children either. How do we figure out to get that motivation that we see isn't there for all kids? If, if you have any ideas, I've, I've been searching for that my whole career, so I'm just <laughs> have you here in front of me so I can ask you the question. So, And I do appreciate your expertise in a lot of this kind of stuff, but 
I, I just constantly am searching for what kinds of things can we do to meet all of those kids' needs. And, um, yeah. And Mr. I, Chair, I'd be happy to take that. Okay. And I think I have a nice little hot house with uh, my children That's and true. stepchildren <laughs> and uh, the child I'm a guardian of, all of whom have tried different kinds of education options for themselves. I also serve as the vice chair of an online charter school uh, operated by Northwest Regional ESD. Uh, and we, I, I would hope that our testimony isn't seen as opposed to uh, a, looking for the widest possible breadth of range of options that make sense to offer students so that every student can, every student's need can in fact be met. I don't know that we'll ever achieve perfection because uh, human beings are messy people. They they come in all sizes, shapes, abilities, interests, levels, uh, health levels, etc. And we have to try to do the best we can for all of them. And I, I think that making decisions for the best interest of your your own child is one thing. Uh, policymakers making system wide choices is something else again. And with enough resources, I do believe that we can uh, follow the good patterns and choices that have been made inside Oregon and in our partnering states that uh, are public systems. Uh, we have had magnet school programs and charter school programs. We've had uh, uh, things like home source in Lane County. We've had a number of different ways of serving individual student needs where, th where that's the appropriate option. But recognizing that we're talking a very small subset the vast majority of students do anywhere from relatively well to superbly well in a public school s setting. I raised my children with the, the lesson that their public education was a gift from the taxpayers of Oregon and they better take it seriously and do the very best they can with it. For each of them, that was their, uh, that was their mission and goal is to try to honor that gift and, and be good students and work hard didn't mean that that was always their best choice and, and several of uh, our kids did try other options and, and those were more workable. I think the public system can do that and the better it's resourced in a thoughtful way, the more those choices inside public education we can offer. We certainly don't prohibit individual families from personally choosing other things. Homeschooling is wide open in Oregon, uh, private schooling also. But some of those are personal choices that are also personal payment. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. You know, I think that, that this committee and the legislature has done some things to, to try and get at that. Uh, even this session, um, kind of the bill that we did, Central 208, that, that expanded access for charter students to, to in district, uh, district school facilities and extracurriculars, I think is the kind of thing that that kind of walks around the edge of your question, that, that gives kids meaningful participation in the in local district and, and kind of seeks to improve kids at a relatively low cost. Um, the charter, I mean, charters generally, the OSBA has charter members. Um, the charter system in, in, in Oregon is relatively broad. It's relatively accessible. They are public schools. Um, they offer meaningful alternatives to many students in the state. Um, and I know you said anything except for resources, but the, the problem is that resources are what get you the things that, that enable kids to succeed, like like appropriate um, um, modifications for the student. Our guidance, you know, our, our guidance counselor to student ratio is way out of whack. It's way above the, 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 um, the professional uh, best practices nationally. These are the kinds of things that you don't know, have, you have class size 38, 40, at, you know, in districts at high school. These are the kind of things that, that, that are resource dependent. So. So there are some things I think legislatively, and the committee's done a good job, and the legislature's done a good job trying to get at them. But it is it is about resources, and OSBA has been in those discussions in terms of cost control and revenue. And you know we have kind of other policy positions that I'd be happy to talk about that come come up in Senator Hass's committee all the time. Mm -hmm. But um, just policy wise, you know it is about students <coughs> and teachers and professional staff, and it is to a certain extent a resource game. And thank you very much for that question, Chair Roblin. Um, as a parent, I'm certainly not unsympathetic to um, children with disabilities or children with special needs. Um, my husband and I have four foster adopt children who are now <coughs> young adults, um, all who had extreme neglect and abuse issues. Um, one of those child children had uh, moved 11 times before the age of three, and um, we 
made a personal choice <coughs> that the public school system was where we wanted our children to be. And I have to say that the public school system did a marvelous job. Um, I think that if parents work within the schools to make the needs of their children known and um, have some flexibility um, in uh, working with those schools, um, they do an outstanding job. So running from the public schools or battering the public schools, I'd like to acknowledge and recognize the excellent job that we are doing <coughs> with limited resources and would hope that a bill like this doesn't take away the resources that we already have and that we can continue to find more resources for our schools. And the other, yes, Senator, well, let's go to, let's go to her. Sure. Senator Gelser first, just because she hasn't asked a question yet. Yeah, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to thank everybody on both sides of the issues that have testified. And just wanted to make a comment. Usually when we have these hearings, we have, you know, people that really disagree pretty vociferously and we all listen politely to one another. I get distracted when people are um, kind of openly laughing at the, the stories that people are telling. And I hope we can continue a very respectful dialogue in, in the room. It, it's not a benefit to the um, to you. the proponents or the opponents of a of a bill. I think it's just important to everybody be respectful. Thank you. W with regard to your question and the answers, um, it, I, I think there's a there's a caveat that I would just like to make known. And the, the caveat is resources aren't the only answer. And the reason they're not the only answer is because of the, exactly what you described, everybody's an individual. And in those individual schools, your, pub, your choice for putting your children in public school should also be somebody else's choice for putting their children in private school or home school or charter school or whatever. And so those choices are, are, are great opportunities. With regard to resources and class size and whatever, I think the, uh, the avenue that uh, private schools and charter schools fill is the class size dilemma. They, they're using less resources, less economic resources, and providing opportunities for a parent or a student teacher ratio that is somewhat better than the school system what we see coming out of those schools is higher graduation rates. Most of them are graduation rates, you know, close approaching 100%, if not 100% graduation rates, where the public school dealing with a, a wider variety of participants is struggling to hit 70%. And so the, there, this makes that choice a valuable alternative and I'd like to respond to taking money away from the public good by putting, funneling it into an alternative school of some variety. The public, these children are that public good we're describing. It's not the school system. It's not the territorial monopoly that is the public good. It's each individual life that we impact. So anybody who we can, you know, provide meaningful input into their life, we're going to get glorious returns on the outside because we impact a young person in a positive way. So I think we should keep the discussion wide open with regard to choices and help parents make wise choices with their economic ability and with the state's money figure out how to appropriately use again. Parents' money is coming into the state. The state's not printing it on a printing press. The, the public money that is coming into the state needs to get spent in every bit of as wise a fashion as the money spent by those individual parents in private schools. So I think what we really need in this discussion is Everything is a legitimate option. It deserves a rational discussion about the pros and cons because no one size fits all. We saw, saw that with the kid trying to wear his sister's shoes. You know, it just doesn't work. And so I think that's the key to this entire discussion, and I look forward to dealing with this in future sessions. I guess I'll end comments by saying um, I... 
I have always been a person that loves to listen to all sides of an issue. That's important to me, and as a principal, whatever. The the reality is, in, in the other sense, is that we have an Oregon Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, and it, and it prescribes certain things about what we have a responsibility to do as legislators and a public school system, and it describes the public school system that we have a right to. And as I would tell kids in high school, you may not be having a good day today when I was dean of students, but the reality is this is your constitutional right to this free public education and because it's a free public education. And I have an ob obligation to make sure that we help you in any way I can make that available to you. And if you choose not to be here, you're giving up something that you had a constitutional right to have. Um, and I would hope that all parents see that and recognize. And we need to continue to listen to think about ways to do this. But at the same time, we need to understand we've been given a responsibility on a, to deal with a public education system. Uh, I agree parents need to make choices. And schools, I hope, support those parents making those choices um, in lots of different ways. And, and I think that's why charter schools have been the way they have in this state. It's why we've passed some things that allowed charter school kids to participate in some of the things that we do in public schools, whether it be sports or other things, that I think is the right thing to do. Uh, I would ha we've done it with homeschoolers already. I mean, I think there are, are reasons that we need to be in this for exactly what you're saying, is that our goal is that every child out there gets what they need. Um, but I appreciate the conversation today. Thank you guys for being here. I don't know that I need any more conversation, but... Thank you for that, and we will close our public hear informational hearing on Senate Bill 437. Um, and with that, we're going to close our, oh, we do have a meeting on Thursday just to get a report back on TAP, TAP which is uh, the Native American education thing, what they did on attendance. We'll get your stuff to you. So I know some people can't be here, but it's just collect a report. Yeah, that's fine. So with that, we're going to close our education meeting for today which happens to be the 13th of June. Thank you. Sorry, that was just so...